Welcome to the Modern Perfumery Podcast, the podcast where I interview perfumers and people within the perfume industry. In this podcast, I hope to find tips, tricks, and inspiration for those of you interested in creating your own perfumes, whether that be at home or if you're looking to become a professional perfumer. In today's episode, I interview award-winning indie perfumer Sarah McCartney. She founded her brand 4160 Tuesdays back in 2011, and in this episode we talk about how she started the brand, what she did before, and also practical tips which can help in your perfumery, such as her concepts of clouds and how to use them to create perfumes, as well as some formulas for a rock pool accord. So if that sounds good to you, then listen on to the rest of the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Today I've got Sarah McCartney with me here. She is the a perfumer and founder of 4160 Tuesdays, a small niche perfumery brand based in Hammersmith, London. So welcome to the podcast, Sarah. Firstly, how are you today? I am very well, thank you. Um, just set up a shop in German Street this morning. Very nice. Yeah, and I'm quite excited about that. Quite so good. I'm Extra, even more excited than normal today. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I mean, you've invited me to your lovely studio and it's very nice. And thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Always welcome back. We like yeah. guests and especially we like you. So tell me a bit more about this shop in German Street. Uh, what is it and what exactly are you doing there? Well, fortunately, fingers crossed, we hope to sell perfume. Yes. That is our intention. It's always good is, for a perfume brand. I know, you hope, but it doesn't always happen, as you yes, know. Yes, yes. So this is a great organization called Lone Design Club, yeah. LDC. Yeah. And they take pop-ups in very interesting places. And, uh, you know, London plus around the UK plus around the world. And they're in partnership with Crown Estate, who have, because of recent history, a lot of empty shops. Yeah. So they're filling them up with interesting stuff. Yes. So this is all independent brands. It's a, a conscious shopping event it's at 23 german street which is posher than i could very nice ever. location ever. yes see. exactly you know you know that you know yeah. well because floris yeah uh, trumper yeah um check and speak i think are down there the back door to fortnum and mason lots of perfume places but young brands i mean ours is not that young but not compared young, to but floris yeah. yeah we think we can how old is your brand? How old is the brand? The brand is uh, 2011, so currently so 11, 11 years, years old. Yeah. When's your 11th birthday? Uh, it was May, technically, so yeah. 12th birthday will be May next year. I hope I'm invited to the uh, party for that. We keep forgetting <laughs> to have parties. So we're I'm just like, joking. oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but if we have one, you can come. Thanks. Uh, permanent party here, you know. <laughs> But anyway, uh, tell me a bit more then about the story behind the brand and why did you decide to start it in the first place? I slid into a brand. I didn't launch it. I just, yeah. I was writing. I wrote a novel about a perfumer who makes scents that remind people of their happy times. Yeah. And I wanted to be a novelist. And then I thought, I know, I'll go and see these perfumes I described. Yeah. I'll see who sells them and then I put that there's a little list in the back of the book yeah. if you want to smell like this then you can buy that and so I went shopping and at the same time as sending the book to publishers and getting it rejected and I found on the way that nobody was making these perfumes that I wanted to describe they just weren't yeah. there and I'm from one of those households yeah. where it's like well, yeah. no, you've got you've got to make it. You can't we can't afford one. Make your make your own. Yeah. You know, we made cakes, we made clothes. So, were those um, perfumes in the book that you'd written about that you actually had come up with? For you'd kind of come up with the smells for those perfumes at this stage in the yeah. book. Yeah, exactly. And then I you just, were looking I, just out for now. I need to find that perfume. Yeah, I, I'd invented the fragrance in yeah. my head. I say, like, I mean, two of them were roses, yeah. so that was quite sim simple. But one was the smell of a a greenhouse or a conservatory full of plants. One was uh, a day at the beach. One was uh, one of the characters' grandfather's sheds at the bottom of the garden. So, uh, honestly, you go out, and, well, this was 2010, just after I'd left Lush, because, of course, that's part of it. I was Lush's head yeah. writer for 14 years. So well, you have the, to tell me a bit about that There was next. that, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, that was fascinating. But that kind of made me a writer, but it yeah. also made me aware of... yeah. All the smells. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, I, I imagined these fragrances and described them in the book and thought I would be able to buy them, but yeah. nobody had made them. Yeah. So I thought, well, that could be me. Um, so you went and just bought a load of, I guess, essential oils and things like that? Or? Oh, you know, I bought all kinds of rubbish, Sam. You know yeah. how you do when you're starting yeah, off? Yeah, you just go and buy like a load of things that you find online in yeah. different shops. French vanilla fragrance yeah. oil. Then yeah. I tried to get an SDS. I mean, the first version of Over the Chocolate Shop that I made, yeah. which is now one of our bestsellers, yeah. I, I got some hazelnut thing yeah. and some chocolate <laughs> thing. And, some little, and, I, and I made it and it smelled great. But then when somebody said, can I buy it? It's like, ah, well, actually, no. Because yeah. I have no idea what's actually in it. So about five, six, seven, maybe eight years later, yeah. I thought... Yeah, I'm going to remake that, but I'm going to do yeah. it properly. So is that a problem that you found near the start of your journey in perfumery, that you had all of these different things you'd bought, but then you suddenly didn't know how to make those perfumes legal and kind of ready to sell? Was that kind of quite a challenge, you'd say? Oh, it, it, was, it was massive. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, I mean, there was some stuff on the internet then, yeah. but no means as yeah. much as yeah. there is now. Um Although I'm not sure it helps, there's been a proliferation of information, but yeah. some of it's rubbish. Yeah. And so I've seen no, a lot of that online yeah. myself. There's, I mean, that's why it's probably why yeah. you and I both started to yeah. go. And I thought, there is, there's so much terrible out yeah. here. Let's try and help. Um, but it doesn't stop them. Yeah. So, yeah, trying to find how to make something yeah. legal. Yeah. That's, that's why I set up the Brick Walls and Flaming Hoops course, yeah. so that nobody yeah. had to go through it. Yeah. Um, and one for lowering the ladder so yeah. people can climb up, not raising it so they can't. Yeah, which I think is great because I think already perfumery is hard enough to get into. Mm -hmm. um, so about your courses, um, for people who are listening, some of them might be interested given that I assume people who listen to this podcast will probably want to be making their own perfume. Um, mm -hmm. What courses do you offer and what kind of problems do you hope to solve for people with those courses? Yeah, the whole, whole range. There's everything from... Pop in on an open day yeah. and customize one of ours. Yeah. Uh, two five day live workshops here. So yeah. it's live plus I've, I've got the big screen there so that people can join in. So this is kind Zoom of like a boardroom well. as well as just a. Yeah, it's just exactly. A it's got the tech now. Yeah. yeah. So people will sit around yeah. this table. I fit in about six yeah. to eight and stay here for a week. Yeah and get yeah. thoroughly immersed in it and in fact i i set up the zoom version thinking that yeah. people from overseas would yeah. log on actually the only person who came by zoom was from oxfordshire <laughs> and we had people turn yeah. up from the us yeah. and uh romania and yeah. switzerland that's actually cool, to be in the room it is it is so, so, that, so you have like the, a, a shorter kind of course which is i guess more an experience if you just want to you don't not necessarily interested in full-time studying perfumery but you want to just one-off kind of be able to make your own perfume and then you've more got a course for people who want to actually learn perfumery themselves and maybe get ahead start what they want to do at home and then i've got I guess you've got the flaming hoops course as well which is if you actually have kind of done your perfumery at this stage but now you want to move on to selling your perfumes and you want to make sure they're legal and everything like that right pretty much nailed it yes and the equivalent of all those yeah. we do as the slow stent school on the yeah. Patreon as well. Yeah. So people, if they don't have yeah. a week's worth of money, they you can pay a tenner a month. <laughs> yes, exactly. Do that because I just want to make it accessible. Yeah. So yeah. I want to I want to share it out. Yeah. And sometimes the brick walls and flaming hoops, which yeah. is actually a quote from the Independent, yeah. describing me and what I'd gone through. <laughs> um, yeah. But that. That is partly to make sure that I put people yeah. off yeah. by actually spelling out the reality. Yeah, of be, being a perfumer and running a perfumer business because, yeah. I mean, I'm, I've been learning this myself, but I'm sure you're well aware that it's not so simple as for anyone listening, oh, I'm just going to make a lot of nice perfumes, I sell them, and then I'm going to make a lot of money and then I'm going to be a millionaire, right? It's almost <laughs> the opposite. I would say it's kind of like an artistic... It's almost akin to being an artist where your career is I'm going to go make a load of paintings and sell them for 99% of people who get into it it's going to be quite tough and then maybe the 1% are going to make it and do absolutely amazing out of it right mm -hmm. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and there was one question which I'll probably ruin now but there's, there's one question in that particular course mm. when I, we're talking about the realities of retail yeah and and I say 
So, group, yeah. what do you think? If you were to go in, get a meeting with Selfridges and Selfridges said, we're interested in stocking your fragrances, how many do you think they'd like to buy? Yeah. And there's always somebody in the room who says, a thousand! Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. great. It's great when they do that. But yeah. I, now I'm going to break the hearts then. Yeah. Because then I said, does, does anybody else... Have another answer, and then yeah. you see them thinking through yeah. from the point of yeah. view of selfridges. What do yeah. they actually want? Yeah. And then they say, "Is it one?" Yeah. Like, yep, yeah, and they don't want to pay for it. Yeah. They actually want you to pay for the space to be there, yeah. put your own stock yeah. in, and uh, you know, where would selfridges put a thousand of everything? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you think through the practicalities, and it. You can somehow, I just watch people's hearts breaking sometimes yeah. when I do this, but um, it's more like the opposite of what you said. It's more like if you start off with a million pounds yeah. and make a load of perfume, you can definitely end up with no money at all. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. Uh, <laughs> but, the, you know, there's a, there's a funnel into that. Yeah. Um, so given that this is all so tough to break into, how did you manage to go from someone who just made your first kind of perfumes after writing this book to actually selling them and being able to kind of profit off them enough to build it into a full business? Slowly. Yeah. <laughs> but also I had what what they call in my other favorite podcast, startups.com. Yeah. I had a long runway. Yeah. yeah. Because if what you're doing is uh, making these things and growing it at the same time as yeah. you're still earning money from something else, yeah. Yeah. then you might have a chance to take off yeah. before you hit the end yeah. and crash and burn. Yeah, because you don't need to take off straight away. You've got a lot longer, Yeah, which so makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I kept writing, but yeah. also, and I'm, I'm happy to say yeah. as a warning to everybody yeah. that... Um, you know, I'd rather have parents, but yeah. instead I got half the proceeds from a house in the northeast of England. Yeah. Yeah. And since it wasn't enough to buy a garage in Ealing, I thought, well, put it into the business. I spent all that. Yeah. It's all gone. Yeah. You know, it went um, <laughs> on buying that time until I ran out of money. I did run out. Yeah. And now it does pay the bills and yeah. pays the wages. Hopefully it will continue to do so. But yeah, but... There's but it's tricky, that, right? Yeah. It's just, there's no, it's no given that it's just going to work out. And I think the fact that there's, you see a lot of perfume brands pop up all the time, uh -huh. advertise a load on Facebook or something, and then a year later, you never hear from them again. Yeah. I think to actually have done it for 11 years and still be going is pretty impressive. Um, yeah. And My accountant thinks that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess most businesses fail yeah. after a year. And yeah. I, I think that the reality is that it is tougher than you think yeah yeah uh and a lot of those perfumes you see all over instagram yeah. and all the rest yeah nobody's bought them yeah i mean mine they have yeah <laughs> because well a lot of those yeah. posts i see them with you know like one or two likes on the post and mm. they've got you know ten thousand views which they've obviously paid to get all those views but yeah yeah and, yeah. It, 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 and a lot of little ghost yeah. instagrams with likes and hearts yeah and, and the faith accounts and everything happy things all over the place and yeah um somebody's trying to build up enough yeah. traction that eventually if they spend enough the hope that eventually they'll sell enough to kind of make up for it mm -hmm. but i mean shipping's yeah. difficult shipping overseas you know uh getting into retail is difficult yeah. just getting that traction getting the the momentum yeah and every time you think you've pushed it up the hill and you're on to you're onto the plains and you yeah. can just push it every now and yeah. again it'll roll that you find there's yeah. another hill yeah so i mean the world just launches stuff out yeah. here at the moment but so anyway, aside from the business side of things, <laughs> yeah. moving back to actual perfumery mm. itself, when you were kind of teaching yourself, how how did you actually manage to find good information out of this kind of sea of bad information? What was your kind of process for actually managing to successfully teach yourself perfumery? Well, I tend to say that I didn't, I'm not really self-taught. I just yeah. learned from people who weren't there at the time. Yeah, yeah. I found good books. Yeah. Mostly. I think for learning perfumery at this stage, given how little content there is on the internet, mm. there's a few books which have some really good information in them that you can learn a lot from if you're willing to kind of put your head down and study it. Yeah. And my absolute favorite was the Kalkin and Jelinek yeah. book. Yeah, me too. I love that one. Yeah. It's just great. And, yeah. and it's so beautifully written. Yeah. Um, 
And even now I keep going back to it and understanding more than I did as yeah, I was going yeah. along. But my first teacher was Karen yeah. Gilbert. Yes, yeah. And I went to three of Karen Gilbert's yeah. courses and you know, that was just like a trampoline. Yeah. <laughs> run, 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 yeah. bounce way. Yeah. And, uh, but I'd already made, before I got to Karen's, I'd already yeah. made three perfumes that I was quite pleased with. Yeah. Yeah. And I went there specifically, first of all, I went on her uh, Aroma Chemicals Day yeah. just to discover what they were like yeah. and what they were smelt like, yeah. what they smelt like, what they did. It took me months, possibly years to get my head yeah. around what on earth was going on yeah. with aroma chemicals. I think this is a pretty good point because when I first started perfumery, or well, trying to make perfume a long time ago, I was just mixing essential oils together and wondering why I couldn't get something that smelled like I would smell in the shops. Yep. And eventually I discovered these aroma chemicals, these synthetics, and then I realized, ah, okay, I see now like suddenly starting to make sense to me. Most perfumes on the market are made kind of 90% of those and maybe have some natural thrown in as well. At the same time, I get a lot of people um, commenting on my YouTube videos asking me, how can I make this kind of perfume just using naturals? Because especially at the moment, there's quite a trend of people wanting their products just to be made of natural things. Yep. Um, but there is a big misconception of perfumery that naturals are a lot safer and kinder to you than synthetics. I was wondering if you had anything to say on that topic. How long have we got, Sam? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've got as long as you need. <laughs> yeah. No, I've always got something to say on that. But yeah, um, yeah I, I think the industry really needs to start taking responsibility for yeah. the just saying to customers that you know they have five minutes to try and sell them yeah. things so they just fling out oh it's all completely natural yeah. and yeah. that's perceived as being oh it's so lovely and safe yeah and it, it's, it's 14 years nearly since i left lush it's 12, 12 years yeah. since i left lush but 26 years since i started yeah. at lush that was a problem then still that people equated natural with yeah. safe yeah and nature. so why is it exactly that yeah naturals can be as unsafe or worse than synthetics well nature makes essential oils not for us to put in perfumes yeah. but to defend the plant yeah. so the next generation can survive yeah so essential oils are basically they're they're nice mm. aromas to attract insects yeah so they can get the next generation of plants. Yeah. They're also built into petals, woods, and particularly the seeds, all the yeah. spices, to defend against yeah, attack. Eating them, yeah. Yeah. So the pith, yeah. uh, the, the well, the the rind on citrus fruits, where yeah. we get all the essential oils from, uh, peppercorns, cardamom, yeah. you know, everything that's yeah. a seed. It's basically chemical warfare. Yeah. There's unbeknownst to us, just all happening kind of in the yeah. plant world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's to try and stop insects, to stop mold, yeah. to stop, you know, they're yeah. antibiotic, they're antibacterial. Not for our benefit, but well, for the, the benefit of themselves. Another yeah. thing is, right, in nature, the actual concentration that you'd find these essential oils is hundreds of times lower than when we distill them into this kind of pure and kind of concentrated form. Yeah. I mean, it's not natural for a million rose petals to leap into a distillery. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, is it? Is it yeah. it's, and to something to have come from nature, yeah. it's great. Yeah. But, but at the same know. time, after we've said that, I almost feel like now we're maybe scaring people off of using naturals and perfumes. So would you say that naturals still have a place in perfumery? Oh, I love them. I love them. And I think that the fact that, you know, rose is made out of, by roses, yeah. 300 or so aroma chemicals. Yeah. Yeah. And actually some chemicals which don't, have yeah. an aroma we don't even know what they're yeah. doing that might be the reason why rose is rumored to make people feel more confident and yeah. peaceful so but maybe one day chemistry and biology will explore this and explain yeah. why at the moment we but just for now we've we got know. the choice between something that smells almost like rose or the real thing which is lovely and the other thing is that of course the regulations which uh, govern yeah. perfume making make absolutely yeah. certain that we do not use any of these things yeah. at quantities that are unsafe yeah so we have restrictions to work with but it's only because if these things are allowed out unrestricted they can do damage yeah so you know for me taking the naturals which are, is always going to smell like yeah. someone yeah. dumped you into into a spa for a massage it's never going to smell like perfume yeah but uh 
unless if well you can get into your isolates but that's a different story but to use the synthetics to open them up give them some yeah. life the stuff that they lost being yeah. thrown into a distillery yeah uh that's when you start getting something that actually smells like yeah. perfume yeah so anyway going back to um your days at lush which you mentioned oh yeah 14 years is quite a long time. Um, would you say that that, even though you were writing at the time, would you say it helped you later on now that you become a perfumer? And if so, kind of how? It helped me to learn interesting things about running a business. Yeah. Because Lush was essentially a startup. Yeah. It's a big startup, yeah. but it was, it was something that was started from the ashes of a previous business that went yeah out of business painfully i don't know that yeah cosmetics to go things just went horribly wrong for them yeah it's it's in a book it's not yeah. a secret but they started again just knowing that all they'd ever done was run businesses yeah. and that's what they knew how to do so lush grew out of cosmetics to go yeah and so i mean their their attitude towards not using packaging not yeah. not wasting anything yeah. was really great they didn't have loads of money like yeah there's so many startups, like you say, the ones that come and yeah. then they disappear. They've got funding. Yeah. They want to start from scratch with the best possible packaging. Lush were just wrapping things in whatever they had yeah. around. And then when they could afford it, they'd yeah. do something better. And I like that. Have also, you, um, would you say you took inspiration from that in your own business? Because I know that you've done quite a lot of experimentation with how your packaging can do things like be refillable or not use too much of things. I, I liked Lush in the first place because I never liked waste. Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, as a child, you know, I was yeah. brought up, the, the, the whole 70s ecology yeah. movement, I was steeped in yeah. that. Yeah. So I came through that being horrified by the 80s and the wastefulness. Yeah. And... And to, to come back into an era, and particularly into a company where they genuinely thought things through about, yeah. you know, should we put the price up of this? Or or should we, because the, the Canadian director at the time was saying, put the price up, put the price up, charge as much as you can, build value. And they're going, no, yeah. I don't think we need to. I think this is fair. I thought that attitude to business I really liked. I didn't learn how to make anything because I never got yeah. anywhere in the other lab, but it was more the attitude towards... Yeah. Um, sustainability yeah. and growth and hand making. And I assume you would have been able to actually get an idea for what consumers maybe liked after doing that? or uh, To an extent, I think what I really learned that was of value was asking yeah. people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, but even more, not just yeah. asking and seeing what they said, because yeah. everyone will say, oh, yeah, I really love it. Yeah. If you put something out, uh, one thing that they used to do at managers' meetings, which I yeah. absolutely loved, which is, he said, it's really kind of yeah. rule breaking. And yeah. I love breaking rules. Yeah. Regulations, good. Rules, bad. Yeah. But they would leave out a pile of the, of the new products at yeah. the managers' meetings, leave them overnight with the rooms yeah. unlocked. And the next day, they would see how many had been nicked. <laughs> <laughs> and if there was one product that yeah. was all still there and nobody had nicked it, they wouldn't bother launching yeah. it. Because Mark said, look, if nobody will even nick the products, what's the point trying That's to That's a pretty good idea, them? actually. <laughs> I know. I thought that was absolute genius. But yeah. um, when I say nicked, it was like, they were going to get them anyway. Yeah. They were yeah. going to be given them. It but they just, were just, it's people like just, they, well, I like that one. So I, I, just, gone. I just make sure I have mine just yeah. in case. you know. It, and I don't like, I'm not saying they were trying to, encourage yeah. immorality or yeah. anything but it was just a great test yeah. and they'd make enough of something yeah. and if it didn't sell they wouldn't yeah. make any more yeah i it, mean it's a good idea i mean yeah i think one thing i found in in this kind of business is you can make a great perfume but if no one if most people don't like it then it's still not going to sell that well right yeah it's like making sheepers you know i did a sheeper once for somebody they yeah. had a, a range of yeah. like they wanted the fougere sheep yeah. or amber floral woods with citrus and they said can you make a better sheep yeah and i said well how's it rating and they said yeah. well um only four percent of the customers like it yeah. i said but what well, of the four percent what they say oh well they gave it a 96 percent approval yeah. rating yeah so, well, no, I can't make a better sheep, but I can't make people like sheep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can make something else yeah. that, that yeah. you know, I can make you a fruity floral, yeah. I can make you a marine, yeah. which is more fashionable, yeah. but, you know, yeah. you can't make people love oak moss. So, I'm just thinking, I imagine you're listening to this and I've heard you say, oh, you could make a fruity floral, a marine perfume, you can make a sheep. Imagine I'd just got into perfumery 
Mm. I'd just gone and bought some raw materials, maybe some naturals and synthetics. Yeah. And I decided today I want to make a marine perfume. Mm -hmm. If it was you, what would be your process for that? How would you go about going from maybe an idea to actually trying to make a perfume out of it? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I'll put in a small ad which yeah. says that on on the Patreon already, if yeah. people drop in and just pay a tenner, they can find my skeleton formulas for Sheepers, Marines, and oh, lots really? of other things That's as well. That's pretty cool, yeah. actually. So, I, I, so if people are listening but they yeah. actually have no idea what we're talking about, yeah. then yeah. that. But... Um, well, I would need, if I say making a marine fragrance, yeah. I would have to think about a place where there is water. Yeah. So in my head, I, I see a place and I build yeah. around it. Yeah. So I did two this year, which are yeah. very different. And one is yeah. called Butter Lily Damselfly, yeah. uh, which is the aroma of swimming across a lake to mm -hmm. smell a yellow water lily. Yeah. So that's a different kind of marine to yeah. uh, saltburn driftwood, which is the smell of the beach at saltburn yeah. where I was. So you got born. That, like fresh water versus salt water kind of. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like as soon as you just a small difference like that, and when you're thinking like a, in a perfumery sense, mm -hmm. all of the plants surrounding those scenes are different, right? And yeah. different notes start popping into your head probably at that stage. Yeah. Yeah, completely. So I'd be more helium out yeah. of the lake. Yeah. Although there's a little bit of callow in, in there yeah. as well, and. There's some, uh, I'm using lily bell. No, yeah. aquaflor. I aquaflor. Uh, yeah. I don't think I've actually smelled that one. Mm, we can get it. Is it, a, um, is it more of like a lily of the valley kind of thing? It or is. is it, more of a, it, okay. it, it is a, quite a lily of the valley, uh, but it's, yes. All of it. I looked into lily bell and lily yeah. and aquaflor um, looking for more um, yeah. biodegradable replacements for the current yeah. availability. The saltburn driftwood, I've actually got real seaweed absolute in there yeah. but not much because otherwise yeah. it does feel like you just fell into a harbour type so I think I remember you told me a while back that seaweed absolute was great if you wanted to create a sea salt note right yes but just yeah, a tiny amount oh, yeah I mean a tiny amount in yeah. in kilos even. Yeah. <laughs> be very, I, I will I'll actually yeah. put that in yeah. in dilution when I'm working at 100% yeah. so I'd still yeah. got to be so careful and it's expensive as well right so it's probably yeah. best for both worlds it, a little will go a long way yeah. seaweed but Callan, um, I've and this is a driftwood bonfire as well yeah. so I've got vetiver a little bit of okay. white birch cool. going yeah. on there so it's like a day on the beach yeah. when the sun is not shining but your family's made you go out for a walk yeah it's maybe some, one of the fishermen's having kind of a little campfire on the on the side I'm, I'm thinking that it's, maybe it's actually the surfers yeah. who've thought hey let's start a bonfire yeah. they've collected the driftwood <laughs> yeah. they've tried to set fire yeah. to it but it won't go because yeah. it's too soggy so yeah. I'm very specific yeah. about these things so, so if, yeah. for you um like a driftwood, this is quite random, but what um, what makes you think of driftwood? Because for me, when I smelt some of the sandalwood aroma chemicals, uh, things like sansalif, I yeah. thought, oh, that smells like what I imagine driftwood would smell like right. as a person who's never actually smelled driftwood. Yeah. So as someone, you've probably smelled more driftwood than me. A lot, um, uh, yeah, because you're, you're a middle of England person, yeah. aren't you? And I'm, I'm a not, not Exactly, yeah. yeah. So uh, in fact, one of my best toys, and I still have it, mm -hmm. It's called Fishy. Yeah. It's a piece of driftwood, and I found it on the beach yeah. when I was three years old, and I still have it. Does it look like a fish? It, a bit. Yeah. Enough, enough, <laughs> enough like a fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> enough like a fish for me yeah. to call it Fishy and yeah. take it home with me and refuse ever yeah. to leave it. Um, so I'm quite familiar with driftwood. And what I like to make it from is a, I kind of did a cashmere Yeah. Uh, Calone Veramos yeah. Accord. Yeah. So we just cut out the podcast and went to find Sarah's Driftwood Accord, which we're now going to smell, which is pretty cool. So mm -hmm. what were the um, the raw materials kind of that roughly the, um, let's say like the yeah. heart, the kind of key things so that I, make this I accord? I thought I put Veramos in, but yeah. I didn't in this one because my, my shortest uh, rock pools yeah. accord, my shortest trip to the, get to, to the seaside yeah. Yeah. is... 50% Calone, 50% yeah. Veramos. Yeah. Boof, straight to the seaside. But this one, in fact, this is quite soggy driftwood. You've picked it straight yeah. from the sea. But this one yeah, is... it's quite wet. 
but yeah. like not in a bad way in like a night in a way that yeah. you kind of get the that realism you get that um you get that wet drippy water mm. off of the wood it's still it's, it's, cool. it's got seawood seaweed yeah. attached to the driftwoods and stuff and you yeah. can smell the uh the calone but mm. one thing i think is quite important with calone is the dosage you have to be quite careful with it right yeah. and this is quite tiny so this is calone seaweed Isoe Super, yeah. Clear Wood, Dreamwood Base, Cashmere and Velvet, and Amiris in this. So. It's pretty nice, you know. I thank like you, it. Thank you. I like it. I'm quite fond of it. And there's a seaside person. Yeah. So I have this theory that wherever you were born, the first yeah. the first breaths you took yeah. imprint yeah, really. on you, and that's where I your home is. Or at least, like, especially in your childhood years, in general, yeah. right? Your the kind of places you go and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm just yeah. If we have if I haven't been to the seaside for a yeah. while, it's like I need to go there and breathe. <laughs> so is that? Would you say like if you had kind of a one place or one kind of biome? that you had to keep all of your, I don't know, all your olfactory memories kind of to, would you say that's kind of the one where you feel most at home kind of by the sea? I would. Yeah. 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 If I had to pin it down, I just keep making yeah. fragrances that are at the seaside. Yeah. Have you got any of your actual perfumes that... Well, I've got a load of them here, but none of them yeah. are actually, none of them are the seaside ones. But One question I did want to yeah. ask you is, what is your favourite perfume that you've made? And that tends to be this answer. It's, it's Tokyo Spring Blossom, which yeah. I made very early on, yeah. 2011, before, yeah. before we technically launched yeah. le legally. I made, it was called Ura's Tokyo Cafe. And then it tends to be the one I made most recently because yeah. I get really excited about yeah. it and then there'll be something else. It yeah. slightly alternates. Um, can we smell it? Yes, we can smell. Um, I'll do Tokyo Spring Blossom. This is the one which got, well, Joe Fairley, who yeah. set up Perfume Society, wrote about this yeah. after she was at an event I was invited to with Lizzie Ostrom, Lizzie yeah. Ostrom's Odette Toilettes scratch and sniff events early days. And... Um, I had made this for a fundraiser yeah. which took place in Tokyo yeah. for uh, children orphaned by the tsunami. Yeah. Um, and it was called Urara's Tokyo Cafe yeah. because that's where it took yeah. place. It's nice. I definitely get like a pink, um, like a pink vibe from it, you know, like a blossomy vibe. Yeah. Yes, it's... It was quite like an iron own heavy fragrance to me it does have islands it's got geranium it's got rose yeah. um, oh, i can smell those now you say yeah yeah my favorite grapefruit and mandarin yeah. i was just using grapefruit and mandarin or tangerine yeah. at the time and everything yeah and just loads of balsams i yeah. just discovered a poppernax oh i haven't even smelled that myself so oh gonna... you're gonna love it <laughs> yeah so uh, it's so curious yeah, yeah. um it's I'd... nice you know i like it it's quite, um, it, it reminds me of something comforting, like kind of Grosjean Accord direction, but that's probably mm. mostly because of the iron on, but it also feels quite different. And I think maybe the, like the grapefruit and the tangerine, or, mm. it feels quite like it's got its own kind of stamp, its own little fingerprint. Yeah. It's nice. What our friend Jacques calls the pat, the, 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 the yeah. footprint. Yeah. The, the, yes. So uh, the paw print. Uh, and I don't. I still don't think I've smelt anything like yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't think I've smelt something where such a high dose of geranium fits in so seamlessly. Mm. Yeah, it, because I in this perfume it really works. Whereas a lot of them, I make. I think it makes it feel like the really generic, old-fashioned fougere. And mm. this is. But in this is completely different. Yeah. I, geranium plus a poppernax and tolu balsam. Yeah. I mean, I, I was making yeah. things out of what I owned. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think that before I knew anything yeah. about making perfume, I was making better yeah. perfume. I think sometimes in perfumery, right, not knowing the, the rules mm. of how much you're meant to use certain things at or which things you're meant to put together, yeah. you can come up with some really cool things. I think you make a lot more things that smell terrible but when you make something that smells good, it's completely different, right? Yep. And then, then somebody says, no, but you can't put that with that. Yeah. And you say, but, but I did, yeah. and it smells like this. Yeah. And, they, ah. <laughs> and then you get that. Yeah. Um, 
something a lot more conventional. This is the one I thought about yeah. for five years yeah. and then made it in one go. Made it in one go. Yeah. <laughs> so it exists. I've got, it's in the book. Yeah. I mean, I can... And one thing I want to um, want to mention as well is I do think personally that as you become better at perfumery and you make more perfumes, what when you were a beginner would have seemed impossible, you could do like loads of different experiments and just never get anywhere close. Mm. When you gain that experience and you've smelled a lot of raw materials, suddenly you can make the connections in your head and sometimes just make something yep. suddenly right and it smells good. Yeah, I think it's the way that you can compose music in your head yeah. uh, after you've learnt to yeah. play an instrument. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, so when people first start trying to, yeah. you know, they get a guitar and they try to write yeah. songs and they're going, plunk, plunk, plunk. yeah. But then after a while, you can write yeah. a song and then come back and play it on the guitar. Yeah. Um, so this, I wanted to make a citrus chipper yeah. of the style. I don't yeah. copy things, but I wanted the feeling, the texture, yeah. the excitement that I got yeah. from wearing them, like in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. So. And then I just waited and yeah. waited and waited. And one day I got some magnolia yeah. leaf and magnolia flower essential yeah. oils and floral yeah. compost. That is the heart I've been waiting yeah. for. That is the citrus, yeah. the, 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 it's the citrus sheeper heart I wanted. Yeah. So was it one of those ones where you knew what you wanted, mm. you were just waiting until you came across it and then you smelled it and you were like, that's yes. exactly what like, I need. Those things together, yeah. I didn't particularly... I wasn't particularly attracted yeah. to the individual aroma of the magnolia yeah, yeah. flower or the magnolia leaf. Yeah. But together, together. they yeah. I just knew they would make the heart of yeah. this fragrance that I'd been That's waiting so cool. to, to fill up. Yeah. So five and, and I didn't know it was five years, but yeah. somebody some somebody dug out a blog post they'd written five yeah. years before saying, yeah. I want to make this. Yeah. Um and it is done. So that but the problem with this one is because yeah. I love it so much, I can't smell it on myself after about ten minutes. Yeah. My brain just goes, ah, oh, we love that. What's next? Yeah, because you've got so used to it. And I find that actually when I'm creating a perfume, if I'm spending a few months really working one thing a lot, yeah. if I smell a different trial of it every day, yeah. I actually find my nose gets used to it so quickly. Mm. Um, how many trials would you say you do if you make a new perfume on average? I probably do about five. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> but then uh, but then you've made it in one before right and I yeah. guess maybe for some you've, you've taken so longer as well out, you know, if it's for somebody else yeah. it will generally be far more yeah. but I mean maybe my standards are lower so maybe I'm just not a perfectionist maybe <laughs> no, I just no. go yeah I like that no That'll but I do. think it's I but, think the good thing about doing fewer trials is you've got more natural perfumes you end up being able to work on mm. and sometimes you can try to make something go from like 90 percent to 91 percent and spend three months doing that while not working on anything else at all right yeah. so there's a you know it's, it's the fit gear rule yeah yeah <laughs> no what's that well it's really the law of diminishing yeah. returns it's exactly as you say yeah. that when you get to 95 yeah. percent like yeah. it will take you the same amount of time to get Together. to 98 yeah. uh, but it stands for fuck it that's good enough <laughs> you can bleep that if yeah. you see fit but that once I was taught that yeah. um, so yeah. it's like halfway between Harry and me uh, um, and we said favourites but yeah. this is the one that I'm tending to wear at the moment which is called Complicated Shadows and it is the eighth in my cloud yeah. series <laughs> this, is so. a, this is interesting it's quite sweet I would say it's sweet and fizzy it starts there, but it's complicated. Yeah. But this has your actual Narcissus Absolute and oh, Orange okay. Flower Absolute and mm. Oris. It smells like, I was about to say it smells like Oris, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Tonka and yeah. Vanilla in the uh, heart. And Vanilla, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's not cheap. Um, no, but, it's, it's really nice though. <laughs> but it does have it does have a little yeah. bit of sort of fluffy, fluffy white yeah. cloud chocolate yeah. ganache yeah. in it, but... Yeah black tea yeah. oak moss and a lot of yeah. citrus fruits so yeah it's called complicated shadows so this is actually something i was interested in talking to you a bit more about because i noticed in one of your videos that you showed yeah kind of a method where you create perfumes and you'd look at things as like clouds planets yeah. moons and yeah. i was interested if maybe you could just kind of explain that method yeah. And kind of how it works, because I think it's quite a nice uh, way, especially for if you're quite a visual person, to kind of get your concept and make everything make sense as opposed to just some kind of lines of random names of aroma chemicals, which yeah. isn't quite so inspiring. 
Yeah, uh, and of course it needs to still break down into yeah. an actual formula. But if, if you just read a formula, you've got no idea yeah. how a perfumer was thinking about yeah. constructing yeah. that thing, what how it came to be. So, okay, so I have in my, oh, here we go, my workbooks for my few day courses, there are some pictures yeah. of these in there. And let's find one. Um, oh, what I'll do is we can show it now quick and I'll take okay. a picture of it maybe later and mm, yeah, okay, so dump it in. Sort of looks you can't yeah. you can't see it from there, but um So it's like a solar system. It's a solar system with, with sun clouds. in the middle <laughs> and some planets on the outside and then some big kind of nebula clouds, let's call them. Yeah. On the yeah. on the out of that. Which maybe I should have called them yeah. the nebulae instead of planets. <laughs> but but um, so what yeah, how does it work then? How it works is I try and get people to think what would be what is the reason for being of the fragrance? Yeah, like what, the heart, what is its like song? The, yes, it's like it could be its heart. Yeah, it, what is its reason? So yeah. if it's, it might be a rose perfume. Yeah. So you start with, with that. rose because it's a rose perfume. Yeah. You put rose in the middle. And you might be doing lots yeah. of other things yeah. with it as yeah. well. Or it's if you want to make it a sheep heart. Yeah. So then you make yourself. Yeah. Your your center. So your sun is going yeah. to be. Uh, oak moss, bergamot, yeah. patchouli, labdanum, opopanax, yeah. whatever you make your sheep. You just pick one core theme. It could be either a single note or a, a chord like that. And right? it's been, I've made a driftwood yeah. one. The driftwood has been yeah. at, it has been the yeah. sun. Yeah. So that's, then so you, you would think, take your driftwood accord and put that in the, on the page, I guess you would write, maybe draw it in a circle and yeah. driftwood accord and that's your. I'd put it in the middle and I think, what else do I want to yeah. add to this particular fragrance? Yeah. It might be that the driftwood is all I want in the yeah. fragrance. I might just release just it. The sun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps, I mean, that particular driftwood accord already has some yeah. Isoe Super. Yeah. And Isoe Super used in a small amount mm -hmm. is a material. Yeah. If you use it in a large yeah. amount, that's when it turns into a cloud, cloud for me. Yeah. Because it's not just there for the aroma, yeah. it's not just there for what it does, it's there for the texture. Yeah, like the structure. And, yeah, and the, scaffolding. And the, the effect that yeah. it has on the rest of the materials. Yeah. It's there yeah. to be a booster. So is it like any material you could use as one of these clouds if with enough dose, or is it only kind of maybe a certain few or you can't things? use anything because um, something like cardamom, say. Yeah. You put couple of drops also seaweed yeah it? You, you can put a tiny bit of seaweed yeah. in i would normally have seaweed as a moon yeah okay so <laughs> there's a little yeah. bit just just delicately like, yeah a tiny amount if you think right i really want to make this into a seaweed yeah. fragrance you still only need two drops but then it could still be your son maybe at yes. that point right yeah it, yeah exactly that's going to be yeah. still going to be a tiny amount clouds are do you know about the low slope of psychophysical function Surprisingly, yeah. I've not heard of it. Well, it is buried away in like one one uh, yeah. paragraph in Kalkin and Jelinek. Oh, okay. Maybe and I should have maybe I should have known that. <laughs> well, no, because yeah. you, you, that's the great thing about yeah. those books is you come back and you, keep discovering new things. Yeah. yeah, and you think oh, that's what it means, yeah. and it's a logarithmic function. Yeah. So that if you put say ten percent this material in, fine. If you put twenty percent of that material yeah. in, it doesn't have double the aromatic aromatic yeah, strength yeah it has about 1.01 yeah effect yeah aromatically yeah, yeah but it does other things yeah so the low slope of psychophysical function means as you put more and more and more in it humans still don't really notice it yeah it they you put yeah. more in for other reasons yeah, yeah. Things with massively high slopes, like say cardamom, yeah. buku essential oil. There are things where you put one extra drop in, you just go, oh yeah. no, I've ruined it. Yeah. Um, those are high slope yeah. materials. And it is the, the psychophysical yeah. part is the physical is how much do you yeah. add? The psycho is yeah. how much do we notice? What do yeah. we perceive? Yeah. So for things like ice super, you're saying there's a low slope, low so slope. you can get away with adding a lot. Yeah. And when you actually do that, you don't really smell a lot of ice super in your perfume, but it creates this perfumey effect that binds everything together yep. and it makes it work kind of thing, right? Hedione as well. Yeah. You know? So you'd say Hedione, Ice Wee Super. Most of the musks. Musks. Um, to an extent, vanillin, because once you put yeah. vanillin in, you'll notice it, but you yeah. put three times as much vanillin in, it doesn't smell three yeah. times stronger. Yeah. Though I notice with vanillin, I don't know if you get this, if I make the vanillin dose quite high, mm -hmm. it can start to smell like sickly sweet on my skin. Right. And I find, so I find personally that 
with vanilla in, unless I want a vanilla fragrance, which is a different story. And then it's like in your model, the sun. If yeah. I want it to be like maybe more of a booster effect, mm -hmm. a low dose is good. But that's just, a, I think, a personal thing, not um, necessarily like a rule or something. I, I think you generally don't need a lot yeah. anyway. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it's 10% yeah. of the sexiest scent on the planet. Yeah. But um, What about Ambroxan? Do you use that much as well? Or? I do, but I find that... Uh, I had an experiment once, somebody, I've never done more, more than like 5% Ambroxan yeah. in a fragrance because one, it costs such a lot and, and two, you yeah. don't need a lot to do what yeah. it does, which yeah. is, I mean, my, my secret secret is, yeah. it, it's not actually mine, it's um, yeah. Carlos Banaim's and it's Bergamot and Ambrox yeah. are, seem to be the secret things that do the yeah. diffusion and the yeah. longevity. Yeah. So, but Ambrox... I normally have around about kind of 2%, yeah. but I sort of almost like treat it as a cloud. Yeah. But you don't need yeah. that. It's like in the effect is of a cloud, but you wouldn't physically put the same dose in to achieve the same cloud effect as you would for other things. Exactly. Uh, I took it once. I did, uh, uh, it was for a client who yeah. wanted the fragrance to smell stronger. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, and he wanted it to last 16 yeah. hours and all the rest of it. I thought, let's see, see what, happens. what happens with yeah. the Ambrox. And I put it into 10% and it just dulled everything. Yeah. everything. It yeah. didn't. It, it didn't, didn't actually... seem bigger. It just went, went yeah. yeah. And I found that can happen sometimes. You keep adding more of things and thinking that it's going to make it stronger or this or that, mm. but it can actually just ruin it sometimes. As well. And that's a quite a cloud type yeah. thing to happen. Yeah. Now you can you just get to a certain point. They're like, okay, that's yeah. enough. Yeah. We have to stop there. I don't think I've found a limit with Hedio. Yeah. When I mean, the furthest I've gone is about I think it's eighty percent. Yeah. I mean, when I was doing like research for my video on Hedio, and I found that it was used in 50% plus and things fine yep. that are sold. So yep. it seems like there's not too much of a limit. The a very interesting thing about Hedione is a sort of new research is that in the receptors in the yeah. brain, it actually dampens down quite yeah. a few of them. Oh, really? So maybe it makes other things more prominent? Or... Exactly. Yeah. That seems to be how come it gives clarity. Okay, okay. So it's, I mean, it's, it's almost like... Filtering like, out the noise or something. Yeah, or putting putting the... The soft pedal on yeah. a piano or yeah. something. So that that's cool. Okay. Yeah, that's quite it cool. Damp it, it stops. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. if you strum a harp and yeah. then you stop some of the strings. So in that, in that sense, it's like you, you're you using it like a piano pedal to affect not the, the notes you're playing on your piano, not the actual notes in your perfume, but the texture and like the, the timbre, mm. the the feeling of the yeah. perfume in a sense. And it, so it appears to enhance something, yeah. so it does, yeah. but others, it'll, it'll yeah. just dampen them down. So and then that's what about, um, sorry. <laughs> so I was just, that's why we have to do so many experiments because even nobody really knows what's going yeah. on in the brain. Yeah. Yeah. What about the, um, just before we move on, the, uh, the planets and the moons? So are yeah. those just kind of your extra notes then that you feel work with amongst those clouds with your heart accord to make it more of a less mono phase, you know, like a less monosyllabic, <laughs> a, a single note perfume, yeah. more of a kind of construction of a scenery? Yeah. Uh, so where, where you might have your top notes and your big yeah. notes and your bass notes, I would... I would divide those differently yeah, and yeah. I'd put them into more like, well, I want it to have a citrus opening, so I'll build it a citrus yeah. planet. Okay. Yeah. So then I'll balance the citrus yeah. planet. I'll have it the way that I want it. It might just have two things in it. It might yeah. have five different citrus. So again, those could be like a natural single aroma chemical or a chord kind of yeah. thing, whatever yeah. whatever exactly. you want. Exactly. It could be, if it's me, it's probably methyl pomplamus and sweet orange and a little bit of mandora yeah. or something exotic that I've got from my yeah. mega citrus collection um so yeah that would I would sometimes sometimes I build it all the way all at once but yeah. this would be my right I want citruses yeah. I want to get that right and then I want to put the, to yeah. kind of circulate around the rose but not knock the rose off balance yeah and then I probably will have a woods planet of some sort and I might have a tiny little herbal yeah. planet yeah so I get those accords and I don't always do this yeah. but it's it's like, if you get those accords right, you don't have yeah. to juggle them all at once. Yeah. You don't have to change everything all at yeah. once. You just think, okay, fine, I, I, that works with this, and yeah. let's build it in. Yeah. So the complicated shadow is I built out of a sunshine accord yeah. and a sunshine fluffy white cloud accord. Sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, and that was the, the citrus <laughs> yeah. roots and the narcissus. Yeah. It's like the yellowness. Yeah. Um, 
and then the the like oris and black tea and yeah. lavender yeah. in there together which you wouldn't long, but nice. that was that was like, yeah. that was like a darker side of yeah. cloud's planet yeah. um so and then took them separately and balanced them all up so the maths can get a bit complicated yeah. when you start doing the variations but then that's just one of those things you have to yeah. deal with right yeah so um, moving back to the clouds thing again, yeah. I noticed that you shared your um, kind of, I would call it an accord, maybe a base for mm -hmm. your magical mystery material. And I think that's great because I think like the, this combination of three raw materials that you've got is fantastic because you can essentially use it almost like a, like a, almost like a white, a primed canvas for your perfume. And by adding small amounts of stronger things, you can quite quickly make um, kind of concept perfumes, let's say, that can smell quite good straight away, which, especially yeah. as a beginner, can be something that's quite challenging. So I was wondering if you could quickly maybe explain how to make that base for yeah. anyone at home and roughly how to use it. Absolutely. I mean, I tend to describe it as being a bit like pasta. Like, if you're going to make yourself yeah. a nice a nice uh, dish and you think, yeah. oh, I'm going to put those vegetables and those spices and those and those, and, that all the, and then you get the sauce together and you go, oh, that's all too much. Yeah. But then if you have yeah. the pasta, you think, oh, that pasta's boring. Yeah. But if, without the pasta, it's yeah. not edible. Exactly. Yeah, because sometimes when you make a... Sometimes raw materials and perfumery, right? The ones, your favourite ones, the ones you love, mm -hmm. they're like quite pungent almost, like that strong sauce. But on its own, it's too concentrated, right? Yep. So and then you put them all together and yeah. think, oh, I've spoiled it. And then that's a lot of high slope materials. Yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. all fighting each other yeah. and they won't they won't separate. So if you put, gently put them on top yeah. of that. So magic mystery material, it's not magic, it's not mystery yeah. anymore, but it's actually equal parts yep. of the original Isoe Super, Hedione, and uh, I used ethylene bracelet. Yeah. I, I'm tending to move, I'm probably going to use it do another one it yeah. might end up being with romandelide yeah but essentially neutral-ish musk right in the middle yeah. kind of musk yes neutral-ish musk and uh so for that reason those things kind of yeah. balance with each yeah. other equally yeah so they're in equal parts and if i'm just doing a one-hour workshop yeah. say or two just an, an, a team building experience you know yeah. the kind of things we get booked for i will do say okay take at least 50 percent that yeah and then, uh, and your things that you really want, yeah. let's balance those. Yeah. And it's, it's three or four things. And they, oh, I've made a perfume. It's almost like your safety net, right? In that case. Yeah. yeah. And then they have made a perfume. And I've had people here actually say, can I just wear the yeah. magical mystery? Because yeah. that's, that's me. <laughs> yeah. I just, people who like wear soft Subtle, beiges, yeah. you know, yeah. it's a sad beige thing. Yeah. But um, I think that's great because I think a lot of people when they start out in perfumery, you mix a lot of things together. They, they don't smell nice you feel like you've made them worse than they were to begin with mm -hmm. and then it can be a bit depressing to feel lost and then having a method like this where you can kind of start to gain confidence and get a starting it point. Is, it opens it out. Yeah. It's like those magic little Japanese yeah. paper flowers that you put in water and they go like yeah. that and you didn't know. Yeah. Um, but people fear when they smell something like magical mystery materials, yeah. they think, oh, well, that'll dilute it. Yeah. They think it's like pouring water in yeah. something and just... And it's like, no, it's like blowing air into a balloon yeah it's like taking something that you've flattened accidentally yeah. and making it into something yeah. that you can do stuff with yeah play games so that's that's what it's for yeah um and i've i've just found it really useful yeah. so people who've made those things they think oh this is terrible yeah. i'm gonna have to throw it away yeah. don't throw it away yeah. just add something to help yeah. it bloom and round it out yes. essentially. give it space give yeah. it space yeah so i've got one final question which is if you had your magical mystery material mm. and you were left with only one raw material your favorite raw material to make a perfume out of with that yeah what would be your essentially your favorite raw material and why Wow. If I could get it, I would use the um, Raspberry Leaf Absolute I originally got from Hermitage, of yeah. which I have... I have I have some of that as well, but it was like a tiny one milliliter mm. kind of thing. I've got a little bit left, and it smelled so much more jammy yeah. and yeah. fruity than the current ones I could yeah. get. The yeah. ones currently smell a lot more leafy. Yeah. And I, I felt the yeah. um, when I smelled it, it was funny because it was like the scent profile wasn't a linear thing. For me, it was quite jammy to begin with, mm. and then 
kind of quickly dropped off into the leafy after the top note bit had gone it, mm. it was like a dried leafy kind of smell i don't know if you had the same experience or well i haven't kind of worn it by itself yeah. i suppose so about a that was just on, on a on a sense trip. trip i left it yeah. for you know a few hours and kind of watched what happened to it yeah i don't remember it's such a long yeah. time ago since i did that. yeah <laughs> but yeah i've got notes somewhere from yeah. 2011 like what yeah. it smelled like when yeah. i used the, when i did that um but yes otherwise if i couldn't get that i'd probably use rose ultimate yeah what's rose ultimate is that a base or is that a uh, is it's that a natural uh, upcycled natural rose from yeah. lmr naturals yeah. so it smells just like rose absolute yeah but it costs less and it's the leftovers it's the second pressing yeah like the second usage of the rose petals yeah. which used to be dumped as compost that sounds and quite like a good deal kind of thing you know it's a very good upcycled green yeah way of using roses and uh maybe both of those together would be nice you know the rose with the raspberry leaf i feel like raspberry and rose are quite a nice pink i have raspberry and rose in almost anything i make for myself i just yeah. start with that if you said i could have two that's what i would yeah. say <laughs> and then the third one i probably would have put a pop axe in a pop axe i mm -hmm. still haven't smelled that so you will have to convince you to let me it's smell some shelf. but it's not far oh can we smell it yeah quick before we yeah. go yeah i hope there's battery left on the camera i hope so oh for a pop axe here we go. Oh, I haven't smelled um, Copia Bazam. Copia. Yeah. I don't know how you smell Apocanax mm -hmm. or there's another one, a Tolu Bazam. Oh, okay. Bazam. So I've, I've done terribly in the balsamic, um, what do you call it, department? <laughs> yes. <laughs> On the, the balsam shelf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for this? Ready? Oh, interesting. Mm. It's like. Kind of reminds me of myrrh a bit. Yeah. With like a kind of tonka bean aspect. It's like petrol kind of note to it as well. A bit of like that labdanum kind of ness, but not the sweet side, more like it's leathery. It's known as sweet myrrh, but it's not a myrrh. Yeah. And what's great is that you're smelling it now that you have lots of experience. Yeah. I smelt it as one of the first things I smelt yeah. alone. And what did you think? When I you thought, know? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> It's, it's, it's odd though, isn't it? It yeah. reminded me of some kind of childhood cough medicine as well. Mm. But it is odd. It's It's got some gluey stickiness going on. As you say, the kind of... Because I think... Um, it's like a vanilla element, but there's this kind of like plasticky side, right? Yeah, there's a plastic doll's head thing going Interesting. on. Interesting. Yeah. And know, it's just... It's yeah. just so much happening in one tiny bottle, isn't there? But... Anyway, yes, so that. thank you for coming on the podcast and it was lovely to smell everything and chat to you. And I'll put links in the description to your course and your page so if anyone listening is interested in checking that out then they can come and find you online. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. That is kind and it's always delightful to have you here. <laughs>